Hi, and welcome back to lecture number 39. Today we are talking about sectional conflict and regional differences in the antebellum before the Civil War. We're going to talk about uh, American and regional culture and then also social structures for our themes. The first learning objective of two is explain the effects of immigration from various parts of the world on American culture from 1844 to 1877. So we're going to go through and talk about three different groups that came during this time and how they uh, affected the culture and society that they came into in the United States between 1840 and 1860. So substantial numbers of international migrants continue to arrive in the United States from Europe and Asia, mainly from Ireland and Germany, often settling in ethnic communities where they could preserve elements of their language and custom. So the Irish uh, are experiencing a potato famine in the 1840s. So between 1840 and 1860, 2 million Irish immigrants come to the United States. The country of Ireland as a whole lost nearly half of its population fleeing the potato famine. The settles, they settle usually in uh, urban enclaves in urban areas. They don't have a lot of money to go and buy land and settle in the old Northwest or uh, further out West. So they're settling in the cities that they land in. So Boston, New York, they're going to have these large Irish neighborhoods. And when they get there because of their Catholicism, they're going to experience nativism. So this is anti-immigrant sentiment. Uh, and then also the um, common cultural practice of drinking whiskey is also something that they're going to, uh, that's going to make them unpopular. Because remember at this time, you have the temperance movement that is very popular in the United States. And anyone who drinks um, is seen as a blight on society. They will assimilate through the use of party politics, so they'll create political party machines uh, in Boston and New York to try and uh, have some control over their neighborhoods and also influence politics um, to help their community. They are going to become very loyal Democratic Party voters uh, into the 20th century. The second group that we're talking about are the Germans. So they're fleeing revolutions in Central Europe uh, that were happening in 1848. And between 1840 and 1860, one million of them come to the United States. You see on the map here that they spread out a lot more across the Northwest. They come with more money, so they are able to purchase land in the Old Northwest. They uh, begin farms. They establish German language schools and parishes. And so uh, in areas of the current modern day Midwest, like Wisconsin, you still see a very big German influence uh, with the beer breweries and the uh, brats that, that, that they eat and also the, the cheese that you have in Wisconsin. All of those are uh, taken from German traditions. They will also experience nativism over language and alcohol use. Um, on the pictures here, there's a couple more things that they bring over with them from Germany. The practice of using a Christmas tree, that was a German tradition that is imported in this time period. And then also the use of a kindergarten. So having all children um, at the ages of four or five years old together in one place uh, in a school setting. And then lastly, the Chinese. They're not explicitly listed here on this uh, key concept, but they are important. Now they're uh, not coming to the United States in as large numbers, only about 65,000 of them had arrived by the year 1860. But the work that they do in the United States is really important. Uh, they work mostly in gold mining and laying railroad tracks. So their labor was critical for the completion of the transcontinental railroad. Some of them are going to do agricultural and domestic work, They'll settle all around the West, uh, and they're usually coming over in five-year contracts. Now, they're, because their uh, migration to the United States was on a temporary basis and it was mostly related to work, there was a high disparity between the amount of Chinese men and Chinese women that came to the United States. And so because of that, families didn't come over and settle, and, and bigger communities did not grow out of this migration. They will experience probably the worst amount of nativism compared to the Germans and the Irish because they will actually be completely excluded from migrating to the United States by 1882. All right, so nativism. Uh, it's a strongly anti-Catholic nativist movement arose that was aimed at limiting new immigrants' political power and cultural influence. So. Uh, in the last two slides, last three slides, I said that this is an anti-immigrant sentiment. 
And it became so large in the United States that there were um, large societies or groups that uh, were formed around trying to keep immigrants from coming to the United States. So the most prominent one was the Supreme Order of the Stars and Stripes. This was the secret of society. And their members uh, became called the Know Nothings because as they were a secretive society, anytime that they were asked about uh, their group, they would reply with, I know nothing. So they got their name, <laughs> the Know Nothings. Uh, it evolved into a political party. Again, they were called the Know Nothing Party, uh, but officially they were called the National Union Party. They got former President Millard Fillmore to run as their presidential party candidate in 1856. Now, they were advocating for increasing the time uh, to award citizenship, going up from five years to 21 years. And then they were also wanting to limit uh, elected offices to native-born citizens. That means that um, if people came over from Germany or Ireland and they naturalized and became U.S. citizens, they still would not be able to uh, be run for elected office. The fear that they uh, would monger is seen in the cartoon on the bottom right. You see um, a Irish man with a Irish whiskey barrel around him and a German man with a uh, lager or a beer barrel around him are stealing a ballot box. So this is, they're trying to instill fear in the rest of the American public that immigrants are here to steal elections, to mess with American politics um, and shape it in their way, which is being portrayed negatively here. All right, so our second learning objective is explain how regional differences related to slavery caused tension in the years leading up to the Civil War. All right, so the first key concept of this learning objective is the North's expanding manufacturing economy relied on free labor in contrast to the Southern's economy dependence on slave labor. Some Northerners did not object to slavery on principle, but claimed that slavery would undermine the free labor market. As a result, a free soil movement arose that portrayed the expansion of slavery as incompatible with free labor. So the North's economy was much more diversified. There was manufacturing, there was transportation, railroads, shipping, uh, banking, finance, insurance, and for the most part, uh, everyone worked for a wage in the North. And any time that there was a cheaper form of labor that was um, not competing on a fair basis, like slavery, then that would depress wages for everyone else. And so the North was starting to take an economic stance against slavery, even if people were okay with the moral stance. So this free soil movement, uh, it proposed to limit slavery in the new territories, the ones that were won from the Mexican-American War and that were uh, negotiated from the treaty with Britain and Oregon in 1846. It evolved into political party and it has a coalition of Northern Whigs and Democrats. They run former president Martin Van Buren, who had also been vice president under Andrew Jackson, and their slogan is free soil, free speech, free labor, and free men. And so uh, just to point uh, your attention to the map on the top right here, you see the uh, concentration of enslaved people in the United States. You see that they're all along the um, Mississippi River Valley, and they start to expand further out west towards Texas. And so what the Free Soil Party is trying to do is stop that spread, stop, stop that movement that's continuing to move westward. All right, so we do see a rise of the abolitionist movement in this time period. We have African-American and white abolitionists, although a minority in the North mounted a highly visible campaign against slavery, presenting moral arguments against the institution, assisting slaves escapes, and sometimes expressing a willingness to use violence to achieve their goals. So this high profile, high visible campaign we see with Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was a novel written by Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, which depicted all of the evils that a, a typical enslaved person would face. Um, it's the story of an enslaved person named Tom who is sold away uh, from one plantation to the next. And um, he goes through a journey of being sold at market and being beaten and punished. 
And it convinced the rest of the North that, e that slavery was evil and it became a bestseller across the world. So Great Britain also uh, started reading this book and buying lots of copies. It made them the, a more abolitionist country than they were before. We also have another book called The Impending Crisis of the South by Hinton R. Helper. And this again is using an economic argument against slavery. He's saying that the use of slavery and this export agriculture economy is going to, uh, at one point, going to be detrimental for the South because they are no longer going to be able to continue to uh, financially keep this up. That the um, cost of land is going to keep going up, the cost of labor and buying enslaved people is going to keep going up, and then the price of the cash crops that they're exporting are soon going to go down. And so having slavery, it's part of the economic system, was keeping them from developing. He's pointing to the lack of large cities in the South, the lack of the white population in the South compared to the North. They only had 5.5 million people. So again, trying to uh, attack slavery from a different angle. In terms of those who were assisting enslaved people from um, in escaping slavery, we have the Underground Railroad. This was a network of stations, uh, quote unquote, for those escaping slavery. These stations were usually safe houses of people who were abolitionists willing to take people on as they tried to make their way up to a northern state or make their way up to Canada. The conductors were the people who would aid the enslaved people back from the south and then up to the north. Harriet Tubman took more than a dozen trips back and forth from the south to the north. Uh, helping free about 300 people. Now for the abolitionists that were willing to go to the lengths of using violence, we have John Brown. He was a radical abolitionist and he was willing to use violence. He has a very long history with this. Um, in 1856, he goes to Pottawatomie, Kansas and he kills five pro-slavery supporters. This is during the popular sovereignty era of the Kansas territory in which pro-slavery and anti-slavery supporters rush into Kansas to try and write a state constitution that's going to either support slavery and allow it or make it illegal in that state. We will get to the Kansas-Nebraska Act uh, a little bit later on in a future lecture, but you have to know that John Brown was involved in the violence that arose in Kansas. By 1859, he uh, has another plan. He's going to uh, lead a raid in a federal arsenal at Harpers Ferry, Virginia, take the weapons, and then lead an uh, insurrection of enslaved people. He goes into the arsenal and um, violence breaks out. He's arrested, he's found guilty, and he's executed. And the day that he is executed, he writes down, I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. I had, as I now think, vainly flattered myself that without very much bloodshed, it might be done. So he here is foreshadowing for the violence to come in the Civil War. He thought that um, the nation could have been saved with a small amount of bloodshed, uh, but he now sees that there's going to be even more bloodshed than has already occurred in Kansas and Nebraska, and more than has already occurred in his raid of Harper's Ferry. His arrest and his attack on the federal arsenal are going to heighten Southern tensions and suspicions of abolitionists. It's going to make them more weary of Northerners and more weary of the Republican Party so that by the time that Abraham Lincoln is elected in 1860, South Carolina is going to perceive that as the federal government soon to abolish slavery in the South. All right, so the Southern defense of slavery uh, defenders of slavery based their arguments on racial doctrines, the view that slavery was a positive social good, and the belief that slavery and states' rights were protected by the Constitution. So in response to Uncle Tom Scavin, a Southern writer uh, wrote a book called Aunt Phyllis's Cabin, which was a response to Uncle Tom Scavin, um, showing positive interactions between enslaver and enslaved, trying to uh, show that the enslaved were better off being enslaved than being free. Another book that would have been more prominent and read by other Southerners is called Sociology for the South. It was written by a sociologist named George Fitzhugh, uh, and he was proposing that wage labor was more exploitative 
than slavery, that the Northerners who were working in factories 11, 12 hours a day for six or seven days a week, we're in a worse position than the people who were enslaved in the South, because at least the people who were enslaved in the South were be being given shelter or care by those who were enslaving them. <clears throat> so this is the economic and sociological response for the South on slavery, whereas you had Hinton our helper giving that economic and sociological attack on slavery from the North. In 1857, there's a financial panic uh, and the North is heavily affected because um, it's heavily invested in the industries that uh, caused the panic. But because the South economy was centered on the export of cotton, and the export of cotton in the shipping industry was not affected by the Panic of 1857, the South fared pretty well. This emboldens the South, making them think that their mode of economic activity and the labor that they use uh, in order to achieve that is superior than that of the North. And so that's going to lead to uh, a stronger posture for the South to try and think that they can be an independent country. All right, so that is it for this lecture. Let's go through the recap. We have Irish, German, and Chinese immigrants coming to the US. They contributed to the country's development and experienced nativism. The free soil movement advocated for slavery to stop expanding. The abolition movement rises with literature like Uncle Tom's Cabin, the Underground Railroad, and violent incidents that are led by John Brown. And then finally, Southerners defend slavery more forcefully as they perceive more threats to the institution. All right, that is it for this lecture. Thank you for watching and I'll see you back for lecture number 40.